Story time. I was 17 years old at the time when my dad and mom took my little brother and sister to Tucson for the day. We lived in a trailer in a rural area outside of Sierra Vista. On our small plot of land, we had two horses, two dogs, a cow, and chickens. As the oldest son, it was my responsibility to feed and take care of them. On the night in question, a stormy monsoon rain with thunder and lightning was raging. However, as monsoons can be, the weather would settle into a lull and then rage again. I was preparing to settle down and watch a good movie when suddenly, my two dogs started barking uncontrollably and wouldn't quiet down. This behavior had been going on for the past week, and I attributed it to the presence of coyotes that I had heard howling at night. I decided to take action, grabbed my dad's rifle with just one bullet in case I needed it to scare off or potentially harm a coyote. Placing the loaded rifle near the back door, I turned on the floodlights outside the trailer. The rain had just stopped, so I looked out the window near the front door and noticed our two horses and cow staring as if through the front door toward the back, where the dogs were barking. Thinking they might be scared of the coyotes, I grabbed the rifle and opened the back door. As I approached, I heard my dogs whimpering and crying. Now, I began to consider the possibility of a pack of coyotes. I put a few bullets in my pocket, thinking I could scare them off if necessary. Upon opening the door, my two dogs rushed past me to the center of the trailer, leaving muddy paw prints all over the kitchen floor. Frustrated, I closed the door and attempted to get my dogs out, but they wouldn't budge. They squirmed out of my arms and seemed terrified. Angry at the presumed coyotes, I decided to run them off or kill them. The trailer sat on a foundation of blocks, and the front and back doors were accessible by a set of small stairs. Standing at 5 feet 6 inches, I opened the back door and peered into the darkness. About to step out, I saw a set of eyes looking back at me from the top of my head to the ground. This figure stood around 7 feet tall. Initially, I thought it might be on a small gravel hill or a bird on a mesquite bush, but as I raised my rifle, the lightning illuminated the surroundings. The light revealed there was nothing on the gravel hill or any bird on the bushes. It dawned on me that whatever it was, it was very tall and still staring at me. A sense of dread washed over me as I realized the rifle had only one bullet, and if I missed, I wouldn't be able to reload before it reached me. Quickly closing the door, I locked it, acknowledging that the trailer wouldn't withstand an attack. I locked the front door and turned on all the lights in the house. Gathering all the bullets, the 3206, and the 22 rifle, I loaded each rifle fully. I stayed in the kitchen with the dogs, praying that whatever it was would go away and not attack. I remained awake the entire night until my parents returned. My dad, furious about the lights, checked outside for supposed coyotes, but whatever it was had vanished, leaving me hoping it was gone for good. I'm from New South Wales, Australia. I just wanted to share my experiences with what you call shadow man and an orb experience. First of all, I'll start with shadow man. Since a young age, I've had recurring dreams of the same figure in my room. I thought it was normal and just a nightmare until I was a teenager and read up in sleep paralysis. Basically, that's what I've gone through since childhood. Two experiences stand out the most. One time I was meditating and I was doing, funny enough, a technique from Dr. Stephen Greer. It is to try projecting your thoughts and location out into the cosmos or wherever your thought vibrations go. Anyway, I asked to meet intelligent life that wasn't human. Stupidly, I didn't set any specifics. That night I awoke in my bed and just knew something was coming in the hallway. I sleep with my door open, and I hear steps into my doorway. A very tall 3D shadow silhouette. It was so tall I could only see to the top of its chest. My heart dropped and I realized I was paralyzed. It ducked to come in my doorway. It had a tall slender body I'd say 7 feet, antlers, and a snout. 
I couldn't see the legs as I was frozen in bed. I could barely move my lips to swear at it. At this point, I was just over it. This has been recurring since childhood so I was pissed off more than scared. I managed to taunt and wave a hand to come to get me and in an instant, it was in my face and I blacked out. That's pretty much it. You're gonna call me an idiot but I did it the next day. Again the exact same but this time I said I only want to meet life that has my best intention in mind. It happened again but this time I wasn't paralyzed. At the front of my bed were two blonde hair blue eyed kids they walked me outside and down the road were two adults on tables both with long hair. They were all wearing silver skin tight onesie suits and the whole time I was just freaking out. I was saying to myself, don't forget because you're gonna. I just thought I wouldn't remember so I tried to stay calm. As we stood in the middle of the road we were just looking at each other. No one said anything. Somehow I just knew what they were all thinking and it kind of felt like family. In an instant, we showed up into the sky and I just remember looking down at everything. I blacked out. I don't remember anything else. My orb story was in 2012. Do you remember when everyone thought the world was gonna end? Well, that's relevant to the story. One night I and my friend went out. It was probably around 10 PM. And across the road just above the trees was the front of a public school. There was a bright bluish white orb about the size of a basketball. I'd say it was 15 feet in the air. Because there were rumors the world was gonna end I thought what I was looking at was a meteorite and because it was the size of a basketball. It was actually a huge meteorite in the solar system coming down and going to kill us all. My heart dropped and as I was watching it just began to do circles as it was moving. A big glowing tail came off it. The orb met up with the tail creating a big ring of light in the sky. I grabbed my friend's shoulder and almost pulled his arm off. I couldn't speak. I couldn't tell him what I was looking at, I just pointed, and when he was looking around going what? What? He finally looked in the direction and it floated down and was gone. I was just waiting for a big crash, waiting for the world to explode. But no. No nothing happened. This was before the days of drones so it wasn't a drone because drones don't have massive glow tails of light and aren't that big. I joined as a park ranger five months before the events of this story. I would encounter the stairs occasionally, but it was random when they'd appear. Once, I went a month without seeing them. Then I'd run into three of them in three days consecutively. Hold on I think I'm getting ahead of myself here. Most of you probably don't even get what I'm talking about. In the national park where I work, occasionally, in the wilderness, you'll find staircases which seem to sprout out of nowhere. And just staircases, out in the open. They don't seem to lead anywhere, and they go away just as quickly as they come. Now, I'm pretty sure this would be a bigger news story than it is, but, as it is, the higher-ups want to keep a wrap on them. I don't know if perhaps they know more than I do about them, but whatever it is, the other rangers didn't care too much for them either. Whenever I would ask about them, most of them would just straight up ignore me and start talking about the weather. Some of them would glare at me as if I'd committed an unforgivable sin and told me to never mention them again. A few of them would just shrug and get on with whatever it was we were supposed to be doing. I did find someone though I'll call him Mark who was a bit more open to talking about them. Listen, you're new here, and most people just get the hint that no one is supposed to talk about them but. Yeah, they just sort of pop up. He paused, and looked at me quizzically. Have you ever come across one which is? Upside down? I shook my head. I've seen one of them like that, and some of the others have too I have no clue what it means. Only thing that you need to know is that you are never to ever, go on them. Do that and the least you'll be getting is fired. He then trailed off, not detailing the things that could happen which would be worse than that. And for a time, I just sort of accepted that. We weren't supposed to be going on the stairs. Simple enough. I even began to ignore it. It was easy enough to ignore them for the most part. Aside from looking really weird, they weren't doing any harm right? 
That was, until one day we got an alert that a kid had disappeared somewhere in the woods. I was sent out as part of the search party, and as I began combing the area where the kid was last seen, I saw it. A set of stairs lined with a yellow carpet. Another one of the rangers, I'll call her Stacy found me staring at it. Stacy was part of the crowd which would ignore the stairs as much as possible, but her face became pale when she saw them. She looked at me and shook her head. We'll keep searching but, well, we need to get ready to tell the folks the bad news. She left, and I quickly pieced together what she thought had happened the kid must have gone up the stairs and then well, whatever happened when you went up them happened. Meaning she had already written off the kid as dead. Me though? I wasn't one to give up that easily, unfortunately, and I was new here and somehow felt that I could pull something amazing off. What an idiot I was. I won't lie though I did feel odd while going up the stairs. I spent a good minute just staring at them initially, unsure if I should go up or not. In the end I figured that if I didn't make my move soon someone would find me, and I did not want to be caught doing it. I counted the steps on my hands as I went up them, 13 in total. Weird and odd number, and as I put my foot on the topmost step, my body shook. You ever have that false falling sensation when you're falling asleep? When you're trying to fall asleep, but it's really your body just trying to check if everything's a-okay or something, I believe. That's what I felt, as if when my foot descended to meet the topmost step, the ground beneath me gave way but immediately popped back into existence. And when that was done, I was no longer at the top of the staircase. I was at the bottom again. And I was no longer in the woods. I was in someone's house and the stairs were still completely out of place. They led up right into a wall. I looked around. The carpet here didn't even match that of the stairs it was a crimson red color. I was in a hallway, and could hear some voices coming from a room. I know it sounds stupid, but the first thing that came to mind was that I was wearing shoes shoes which had been outside in the woods on a carpet. If it was my mom, she would be screaming blood murder at me. What would the owner or owners of this house think? I crept up towards the door, dreading what was coming up. As it was, I couldn't exactly go back down into the woods. Maybe I could keep going up, but would that lead me back home? Or somewhere else? As it was, even though this was a weird situation, I was still more confident with staying here. Because, at the very least, this place was safe. And as they say, better the devil you know. I went into the room, preparing an apologetic face. The room looked fairly normal at first glance. There were four people sitting at a table, two adults and two children, who looked like they were eating dinner based on how dark it was outside. The television was on and there was some sort of news program on which they must have been watching before they noticed me and turned their heads. And that's what was off about them their heads. Each of them had their heads on backwards. Even the newscaster on television had his head on backwards and was looking out with his chair turned around. Otherwise, they were just like you and I and really, thinking about it, it seems almost comical. Though it didn't seem funny at the time. The four of them screamed, and one of them lunged for a knife. I didn't want to stick around any longer and wound back up the stairs. Instinctively, I thought that if I went up them, I would once again end up somewhere else. It was that or go outside the door, but I had a strange feeling that when I went out into the world given what I saw from the news broadcast, I would find a world filled with people with their heads on backwards. As my feet touched the top of the stairs, I once again felt the weird falling sensation as I found myself back in the woods. I sighed in relief now. Granted, I hadn't found the kid I was looking for, but I was safe from whatever those creatures were. However, there was definitely something off here. I realized that quickly enough when I glanced up. There was nothing off initially until I saw that there was something accompanying the sun overhead. It was another sun which had descended towards the horizon. Two suns in the sky. I definitely wasn't back in Kansas. Taking a deep breath, I went up the stairs again. And again. And again. I saw many things worlds which were a lot like our own, but subtly different. People having the wrong number of appendages, 
people who had only one eye or three. Sometimes I would even end up at some different part of time. I saw dinosaurs roam across a plane before I got my common sense together and left pronto. I have my own theory on what the stairs are now their gateways between different universes. I can only think that the fabled inverted ones that Mark once mentioned somehow lead back, but I haven't been able to find one. I've been going up the same set of stairs, hoping to end back home. Granted, I finally got a break. Well, something of a break. I found him the kid I was looking for. The little squirt started screaming the moment I approached him understandable I guess, but I managed to introduce myself and calm him down. We ended up in someone's house, though thankfully the homeowner isn't here. The only thing I could think to do at that point was call for help, but my phone wasn't getting a signal. And so, I went on here and was hoping some of you could help us get back home. I've been scouring the internet and it does seem like we managed to loop back around finally given I can see that the national park where I work at is listed there on the internet. I saw a bunch of familiar sites and news items as well ah, uh, it's good to be back home. Overall, we're doing fine for now, though we are kind of getting hungry. And oh yeah, there is one more odd thing here now that I think about it. It's this keyboard I don't know why but it just isn't made for someone like me. I think the owner of this house had some sort of accident and lost a finger on both of their hands. And they must have had this keyboard custom built for themselves later, because how is anyone with a full set of seven fingers supposed to use this thing? Anyway, do please send help soon. For a number of years I was a camp counselor at an overnight camp in the Muskakas. I loved it more than any job I've ever had, despite the non-existent pay, annoying campers, long days and short nights, crappy food, etc. For one, I got to tell as many scary stories as I could sputter out. There was nothing better than hanging around a dying campfire with a bunch of junior high kids who were demanding the scariest, most blood-curdling tales I knew. And I told them all, the babysitter and the eerie clown statue, the driver and the creepy gas attendant, the woman and her licking dog. I saved my best stories for the overnight trips we made in Algonquin Park, for non-Canadians, it's a massive park in the middle of Ontario, spanning nearly 8,000 square kilometers, when days would be spent canoeing on pristine lakes and nights would be spent around the fire singing and making s'mores and being as rowdy as the only people within miles could be. Once the kids had quieted down, I told them stories of a stalker in the woods with a face so horrifying it paralyzed all of its victims in fear, or the group of campers who decided to spend a night across the lake from an abandoned, or was it? Insane asylum. On this particular night, I'd finished up the tales, once again insisting that they were entirely true, and sent the campers to their tents. It had been an exhausting day, and none of the six kids were in any mood to stay up later. My fellow counselor had also decided to pack it in, leaving just me on a fallen log next to the dying fire. I took a deep breath of the cool, fresh pine-scented air and looked out at the lake. The partial moon reflected off the glassy water, and on the other side I could see towering cliffs, going up several hundred feet. I considered whether we could canoe over, climb up a few dozen feet, and do some cliff jumping. I grinned. The camp director would have my head if we did that. If he found out. Movement at the very top of the cliffs caught my eye. There was a small light bobbing along the peak. At first I thought it was a star, but it was larger and gave off a golden glow. It slowly moved back and forth in a small arc. As I sat up and watched it, Another appeared next to it, bobbing along the top of the cliff. Then another. And another. And a few more. My stomach dropped into my feet. I grabbed my bag and pulled my digital camera out, then focused it on the little glowing orbs and used the zoom function. I counted them. And then I counted again. Oh shit. In a flash I was up and running to the tents. Hey guys. Wake up. We gotta go. There was movement in the tents, and then I had seven confused heads looking out at me. My co-counselor wore a mixture of concern and pure anger. 
I hate to do this, I continued, but the clouds are looking really threatening. There's a big rainstorm coming in. If we get caught in it, it's going to ruin our trip. Seriously? Laura, my co-counselor, asked. We're in the middle of the woods. Where would we go? I pulled a map and flashlight out of my bag. There's a ranger station a few kilometers south of us. I traced the path with my finger. Thank God. We can make it there in a few hours. The campers groaned. Can't we just go in the morning? No, I shouted, my voice echoing across the lake. I lowered it. Come on, let's get packed up and go. I'll tell you a story along the way. I smiled, though I could feel my lips quivering. It's my best one. That seemed to get them going, and within 10 minutes the tents were packed up and we'd begun our trek into the deep woods, with small flashlights our only guide. When I was confident we were moving at a steady pace, I allowed myself to relax and began to tell my favorite campfire story. Centuries before the European settlers made their way into the country, it was inhabited by the First Nations people. They had made the trip from across western Canada, following the migration patterns of large animals such as buffalo and bison. Eventually they reached Ontario, at which point they split off into smaller groups of travelers, each searching for a section of land to call their own. Legend has it that one group, consisting of about 20 men, women and children, had ventured through this very area in search of a place to call home. Though it wasn't even the end of October, the weather had made a turn for the worse, and as the group journeyed around the lake, a fierce blizzard hit. Within an hour, the group found themselves in blinding snow and below zero temperatures. The clothes they had on them were made for the fall, not this sort of weather, and there weren't any Canada goose jackets around back then. But they pressed on. They didn't have any other choice. Night was falling as they reached a cliff bluff, which towered over a cold, choppy lake. There was no stopping for this group, they'd die if they didn't make it past the cliffs. But with darkness setting in and the snow falling even harder, visibility was almost non-existent. So one of the elders had an idea. Using the little kerosene they had left, he lit a lantern for each of the travelers and had them carry it in front of them, not so that they could see the cliffs, but so they could see who was in front of them, allowing them to all follow each other across the narrow bluffs. With the strongest of the men leading the way, the group began to cross the cliffs. The freezing, wet snow soaked every bone in their body. The harsh wind chilled any exposed skin and threatened to push them right off the rock. Their path was no more than a few feet wide, and would have been slippery to even the best of hiking boots, let alone hand-fashioned moccasins. Slowly, painstakingly slowly, they made their way up the cliffs, praying that whatever lay on the other side could shelter them from the intensifying storm. They were about halfway up, hundreds of feet above the lake, though it was well out of their vision. In fact, all they could see in this blinding storm was the lantern in front of them, acting as a beacon to guide their steps. If the light moved up, they moved up. If it went down, they moved down. Each of the travelers was almost in a trance, caring about nothing but the glowing orb a few feet away. For the leader, though, there was no such luxury. He moved forward blindly, feeling along the cliff with his free arm, though his skin was so numb he could barely feel anything. As the path wound back again, he made a misstep and lost his footing, just as a gust of wind blasted his back. He desperately grasped for the hold, but his frozen fingers couldn't get anything. With a terrified scream, he slipped off the cliffs and fell into the icy black lake. The rest of the party didn't see him fall, of course. All they saw was his glowing orb dropping away from the bluff and disappearing in the darkness. There was no time to mourn. They continued on, but the storm was worsening. After another minute, one of the children, his body unable to withstand the cold, dropped away, his lantern glowing until the choppy waters put it out. Another, having seen this, lost his balance and fell. This pattern went on until there were just five people left, fumbling along in the darkness, following the light in front. As hard as they tried, the cliffs were unforgiving. 
The remaining men fell down to four. Then three. And two. And then there was just one left, who legend says cursed the earth as his legs slipped and he plunged hundreds of feet down, his lantern the last one to be extinguished. Of the twenty members who tried to overcome the cliffs, I finished, not one of them survived. They say that sometimes, when the conditions are right, you can see the orbs along the cliff, symbols of the lost travelers who will never find their homes. As the story ended, leaving the campers in an eerie silence, I saw lights up ahead. A wave of relief poured over me. We picked up the pace and found the ranger station bursting with activity, with a half dozen people running around, loading up trucks and shouting into radios. The wind was beginning to really pick up, and I heard thunder in the distance. Hey! You kids! A large, burly man with a full beard and mustache ran up to us. Get in the trucks. We don't have much time. Laura and I led the kids to one of the pickup trucks. What's going on? I asked the man. Didn't you hear? Another gust of wind. Huge storm systems heading right for us. Already been tornadoes touched down. We're getting everyone out of here. Let's go. We all climbed into the truck's bed. I collapsed down, feeling like I'd just been punched in the gut. The ranger climbed into the front and we took off down a makeshift road. My head was spinning. It wasn't possible. How? Laura slid next to me, keeping her voice low. How did you know we had to get out of there? I looked over at her. My face felt empty of any blood. I saw the lights. What? No. No, she gasped, then caught herself. How many? I took a deep breath. Eight. She looked around at all the campers, who were now lying against each other, asleep despite the bumpy road. That's all of us. My God. I nodded and leaned against her. Laura had heard the traveler's story before, and she knew that I'd left out a key bit of information. The lights were real, but they were never random. If they were shining, bobbing back and forth, swinging in a small arc, it was because they had a message. A warning. One light would shine, for each person who was about to die. While my mother and I were grouse hunting up by Benna on Six Mile Like Road in the Mud Goose Management Area we both witnessed a Bigfoot. We were traveling down 2127 from east to west and my mom said, whoa, back up. Down trail 2266 near the bend, we saw a Bigfoot off the trail in the grassy ditch and it slowly moved off the trail west to east. My mom asked me if it felt like it moved in super slow motion. I concurred. The ditch at the site was three feet down the grass at the side of the trail was three feet tall and the upper torso was three to four feet above the grass leaving the Bigfoot to be approximately eight to ten feet tall. We drove to the spot and both noticed a strong sulfur or rotting vegetation. When I got out of the car and immediately felt all my hair stand up on my body. I checked for any sign of footprints on the road. I could not see any due to the gravel being very packed down. There was a small bit of gravel disturbed in one spot near the west side of the road shoulder. We later got stopped by the local CO, conservation officer, aka game warden, checks on hunters. When we mentioned what we had seen and where it was, he remarked that's where people have been reported seeing a Bigfoot. My mother and I have no doubt that we saw one. This happened in 2011 when I was in training for Peace Corps service in Cape Town, South Africa. Most houses here have bars on the doors and windows and are surrounded by gates and fences. The village that I trained in was large and sprawling. My host family was wealthier than most, and while the house was nice, most neighbors had much simpler dwellings and tin shacks. Our fence was tall and stable with a thick wall of a gate and some of the neighboring fences were small barbed wire. The training schedule was packed and I was usually gone all day every day. When I got home in the afternoons I would often play with some neighborhood kids. Sundays were my only day off. One particular Sunday, towards the end of training, I was home alone. 
I was outside hanging laundry and noticed two small boys, about seven to eight or so, in the next yard staring at me. I'm white, and I am used to this reaction. I had never seen these kids before. I smiled at them and continued to hang my laundry. They continued to play and stare at me. My unease with these kids grew, and I thought it was because I was annoyed with being stared at. The longer they watched me the more creeped out I felt. I looked up to notice that they were gone. I quickly went inside and locked the door, the gate was already locked and there was a tall fence surrounding the property. I looked out the window of my bedroom a few minutes later to see one of the kids scaling the fence. I thought about going out there to say something but felt compelled to stay inside and ignore them. The next time I looked the kid had just landed in the yard and somehow he saw me through the sliver of window I was peering out of and made eye contact. Then I noticed that this kid had eyes that were solid black. I felt like he was reaching into me and grabbing my insides. The kid prowled around the windows and door for a while. I don't know what happened to the other kid, but by that time I was totally creeped out. I moved to my permanent site shortly after that. All I know is that the encounter I experienced frightened me so much that even after all these years it still shakes me up to think about it. Until that evening, I have always thought of werewolves as being nothing more than just fairy tales, but that first encounter has left a huge question mark inside of me. I come from a family of skeptics, so I decided not to tell anyone about what happened to me. Then one night my brother came home trembling and pale. He told me about his experience and I felt relieved that I wasn't the only one that seen something. It was after 10 PM on New Year's Eve in the late 1980s. We were living in a suburb of Tampa, Florida. It was either 1987 or 88. I was sitting out front of my parents' home and instead of going out with my friends, I decided to stay home and celebrate the new year with my family. My father's car was parked in front of the house by the road, so I decided to sit on the hood, smoke a cigarette, and wait until midnight. The rest of my family was in the house celebrating. After about an hour I heard a strange sound coming from the neighbor's yard across the street. It sounded as though a man was moaning in pain. The street and the property were dark, so I couldn't see much except for a small light that shined off in the distance on the back part of the property along a cinder block wall. The wall where the light was sitting wasn't finished yet. The whole property itself was wooded with trees and tall bushes. The bushes on the property stood around 5 feet high and over and around 5 feet in width. I kept looking in the direction of the sound to try and see what was causing it. My first thought was that maybe someone was hurt, but then the sound changed. It went from a moaning to a low-pitched gurgling, then growling. The next thing I heard was a loud thud as though something huge jumped and landed behind one of the bushes in the back part of the property. The sounds that followed were the sounds of something seriously heavy, on all four legs darting behind large bushes moving towards me in a zigzag pattern. I started questioning myself as to what the heck this thing was. Was it a horse or a dog it sounded so heavy and I could hear its breath when its feet hit the ground as it came closer. I heard the growling again and it was like no dog I had ever heard. It was at this point that reality hit me and I realized that this thing was coming towards me. I suddenly felt the rush of fear go right through me. It stopped behind a huge berry bush that was across the street from me which was about 15 to 20 feet away. It suddenly became quiet and I couldn't hear the breathing or the growling anymore. I eased myself down off of the hood of the car because I didn't want to make any sudden movements especially since it was so close. The front door was about 30 feet away from where I was and I didn't know if I would make it. I didn't know what this thing was and I didn't want to find out. I was so scared I could hardly breathe. My parents had a lot of bushes and trees in their front yard as well, so I noticed a gap in between a couple of them and I started running. As soon as I started running, that thing started coming after me. I could hear it behind me as it came across the street. I heard its nail scraping the asphalt once or twice as it crossed onto our property. I was not about to look back and as soon as I reached the front steps I jumped to the top step and quickly ran into the house and locked the door. 
I was shaking so bad that I felt like I was going to pass out. Even with the music playing inside the house, I heard the thing outside the front door growling and then it went quiet. I heard another thud as though it jumped off the step onto the grass and I couldn't hear it anymore. Suddenly, I heard my brother-in-law speak over my shoulder asking me what I was looking at. I jumped and thought I was going to choke on my own words. All I said to him was that whatever he did, do not go outside. He started smiling and said okay. I guess he thought I was joking but then he realized I wasn't. As soon as I took a couple steps away from the door, he opened the door and went outside to check, but didn't go down the steps. He quickly came back in and didn't say anything. I asked him if he saw anything and he said there was nothing there. I didn't tell anyone about it. Not even my brother-in-law. Later that night around 12.30 am, after everything quieted down. I was in the kitchen drying dishes when I heard the most terrible snarling growl right outside the window where I was standing. I suddenly dropped the plate I was holding and it shattered on the floor. The fear crept back and I started trembling again realizing that the thing was still outside, but it was along the side of the house towards the back and not the front. I backed away staring at the window, but it was pitch black outside and I couldn't see anything. My mother came into the kitchen and complained about me dropping her plate. I still didn't say anything because I didn't think my family would believe me. I did tell my father that I thought I saw someone outside looking into the window. He grabbed his gun and went outside with my brother-in-law and yelled trying to scare them away. It must have left after that because they didn't see anything. Until now, my sister was the only one who knew only part of my story. My story comes from the Crow Indian Reservation of Montana. I was dating a Crow tribal man at the time. I'm not sure how the subject came up but he shared several experiences with me about his and his family's encounters with the Sasquatch people. When he and his brothers were little they were playing in the woods when they saw some bushes rustling. They thought it was probably a skunk or raccoon in the brush and they started throwing rocks at it. He said suddenly an enormous Sasquatch stood up and yelled at them. It chased them and they ran home as fast as they could. Looking back as an adult he said it could have caught them at any time but only seemed to want to scare them away and back home he joked it was rather like an elderly neighbor yelling at naughty kids to get off his lawn. He described it as about 8 to 9 feet tall and had white hair. He felt it was an elder. He said there were many sightings over the years, males and females in varieties of colors, but mostly brown and black. But there are a few gray and white. A brown female would often peek around a tree and look at the laundry on the line. She seemed curious. He said a fire came through the area and burned out the food sources that they ate. They moved on and they haven't seen signs of them since. They also have many stories of the little people and sometimes they are seen with the Sasquatch. Most of them will not talk about the little people as it's considered disrespectful and bad luck. But there are stories of the little people helping the crow. I won't repeat those stories out of respect I have. Some of my crow and Cheyenne friends on the reservations have had many Sasquatch sightings and UFO sightings. Maybe I can convince some of them to email you their personal experiences. I wish I had more details but that's all I can remember about his stories. My personal story happened near Nye, Montana. My friend and I wanted to pick the perfect spot after hiking in. We saw a wooded little island in the middle of the, Stillwater, river. It was so perfect, we waited out and set up our tent in a clearing in between the trees. We had a lovely night. We chatted away, cooked some great food, and went to sleep. I woke up in the morning to small pebbles hitting the side of the tent. Then something poked my side of the tent like a finger. It was close to the zip-up window, so I unzipped it a crack to see what was outside. There was absolutely nothing, yet something unseen continued to slowly poke the tent. I poked my finger to the outside then it would poke, then it poked the top of the tent, then I poked the top of the tent. I was not afraid, I was just more curious as to what this invisible being was. I didn't feel any malevolence from it, more like it was just playing a fun little game. 
This went on for several minutes and then it seemed to get bored and stopped. When my friend woke up I told her what had happened. We looked all around camp and no clues, no prints, nothing disturbing, just a beautiful Montana morning with an odd experience. I'm Irish and grew up on myths about fairies, giants, and other fae folk in Celtic legends. The fae or the unseen people can either be helpful and friendly or malicious depending on how humans interact with them by doing something that annoys them. They can be mischievous to outright dangerous. It makes me wonder if our ancestors actually knew the truth and we turned truth into mythology as we became civilized. I truly believe in the unseen people, not just the Sasquatch people, but probably many other beings. I have no idea what was poking my tent I should have been able to see something. But all I could see was a tent fabric being poked by an invisible finger. I don't know what type of being it was but it let me know it was there without showing itself. Maybe someday we'll find the truth about the other people or the good folk as the Irish affectionately called them. In 2017 my son-in-law built my daughter a house on land I'd given them and I was his helper. One afternoon I took a load of scrap to the landfill in the adjacent county and arrived late just before closing. The sun was going down early because it was late fall. The guy operating the landfill seemed ready to leave and wanted me to hurry. I told him I would hurry, but I asked what was up? I'd been there multiple times but earlier in the day and he never seemed to be so nervous. He said the funny bears came out after dark and got scraps of food from the landfill. I asked him, what's a funny bear? He said they live in the woods and some folks call them wood boogers. I told him I knew what those were. I had my October 1980 face-to-face -face encounter with these wood boogers or Bigfoot in Cullowee, North Carolina with one up a tree that whistled getting my attention. The landfill is two miles west of the Okmulgee River in central Georgia. It's all woods and swamp east of the river. This is a true account, even though it is difficult for me to believe sometimes. This occurred right after I had graduated from high school in the spring of 1973. That fall, a buddy and another friend of mine came over to my place. We lived close to the University of Tennessee campus in Knoxville. We went over to get a pitcher of beer at a local watering hole. There were no girls with us to bother us or anything like that. Well, we got a pitcher of beer and then came back to my neighborhood. One of us had to relieve ourselves, so we turned into a Baptist church parking lot that I've attended a time or two. We turned up into the driveway. There were about six characters dressed in cowled red robes like a monk wears, hoods, and robes all the way down to the ground. So we come around the corner of this church. My buddy was driving his beat-up old VW Beetle, freaked out, hit the reverse, made a U-turn, and got out of there. We tried to get him to go back but, of course, he wouldn't do it. The oddest thing about it was these people, whoever they were, seemed to move strangely. It almost looked like a scattershot thing, elbows raising, that sort of thing, they just kind of moved around the corner. I've wondered about that for all of these many years. I haven't got a clue. All this time, we just kind of figured it was devil worshippers. But, if they were, why in a church parking lot? I'll never know but it sure has freaked me all these years. This event happened in April of 2021. I live in Yale, Oklahoma. My wife works in Stillwater as a nurse. It was an early Saturday morning and my wife got called into work. I drove her and my 11-year-old grandson into town to drop her off. My wife was still sleepy because she was supposed to be off. She quickly nodded off by the time we made it to the highway. The sun hadn't come up yet but it was light enough to make certain things out. Off to the right is a grassy clearing, and there are several animals around the area. But something was odd. This thing was there, it was white and acted like it was trying to hide. I slowed down a bit and saw it throw something in my direction. Whatever it was hit the ground and bounced back up. 
The creature took off running on two legs then sort of morphed into running on all fours, that's the best description I have. I was curious, and we wanted to stop, but I knew my wife had to get to work. On the way back home my grandson asked what that thing was back there. I had no idea he was awake and saw it. I told him I don't know but we're going to go check it out. I found an area to stop right where I believe I saw it. I walked a short way and quickly found what was thrown. It was a dead turtle with the shell mostly torn off. I quickly realized if it had been a little more accurate it could have taken out a window and caused injury or an accident. I'm always armed when I'm out and I wanted to explore the area more but not with my grandson. I felt danger and I listened to my discernment. The way this thing moved was not natural and these things are 100% nefarious. No one can tell me different. I believe I know what they are but I've heard a few stories. To say exactly what I believe is that they are evil. There's more than what we grasp obviously but it is in no way shape or form an animal. I took my grandson back home and my daughter was there to watch him, so I went back. Estimating the height, there's a five and a half foot fence right where I saw it. I'm six foot three and feel that whatever I saw had to be 11 or 12 feet tall. That made me a little uneasy and I'm glad I took my grandson home. I did manage to get inside the fencing and realize the ground had hidden holes they would have seriously injured a person had they stepped into one. I have no idea how this thing managed to navigate the terrain the way it did. There were no visible tracks. We talk about it in the open, I don't see any reason not to especially since my grandson saw it. That reaffirms in my mind that it was there. I wish I had more of a description but it was instantly quick, insanely quick, when it took off. In 2003 I was taking a trip across the country with my father, from east coast to west coast. We had camped out for a couple days in federal land in Utah and needed gas. It was an extremely desolate area, but we passed a little crossroads. There was a convenience store built on the side of a rock wall. When I walked in I remember there was an old man behind the counter and a younger looking man in one of the aisles. No flags went off, just a normal setting. I was paying for the gas at the counter and the younger man came up behind me to stand in line. He kind of passed the boundary of my comfort zone so I casually inched forward a bit. He did it again, so I gave him sort of a side glance, a quick glance to the eyes. Looking back at me were watery, completely jet black eyes. I only glanced at them for a split second but that was enough to start to process what I saw. The hair on the back of my neck went up immediately. It freaked me out, but I left calmly. I got in the passenger seat of the RV. My father was done pumping gas and we left. I didn't exactly have any feeling of fear, more just something I couldn't process from the norm. Two days later we made it to the west coast, near San Francisco, and headed north on the Pacific Coast Highway. We made it to a campground in the small coastal town of Eureka, California to camp and stay the night. The town had a movie theater that we could walk to from camp, so we caught a show and headed back for the night. I climbed up into the loft and fell asleep. About an hour later I woke up with a fever of 104 and very weak. I woke my father and he drove the RV to a hospital in town. In about 15 minutes we were pulling into a parking lot. After waiting for a couple of minutes before going in, the fever broke. My temp dropped back to normal but I felt worn out and drained from head to toe. I remained drained for a couple days, but no fever. We stopped at a walk-in clinic in Eugene, Oregon to have blood work done. Nothing abnormal was found. I don't know if the sickness had any connection to the young black-eyed man I glanced at, but it has always kind of haunted the back of my mind. My father was well aware of my description of the young man and was there firsthand to see the strange illness. We do still talk about that strange day 20 years ago. At a young age, experiences which I have now come to suspect as being abduction experiences occurred with terrifying frequency. For many decades I was convinced they were nothing more than a recurring nightmare, 
but now I am not so sure. The best that I can tell, it first began in 1976-807 when I was living in Chateauguay, Quebec, Canada. The experience begins after I am put to bed, despite my protests that leaving me alone in my bedroom would result in harm to me by unknown entities. Shortly after being put to bed, the red eyes would appear right outside of my bedroom window. They seemed to hang there, though I was never once able to make out any physical body that housed these terrifying eyes. Though I have memories of these eyes communicating with me, despite their lack of a mouth. Sometimes, they would be reassuring, other times, they were terrifying in their cold, calculatedness. I would always fight the desire to sleep because I somehow knew that the eyes were waiting for me to fall asleep before they would be able to interfere with me. I was never once able to avoid falling asleep, though I tried valiantly. Inevitably, my eyelids would begin to droop, and before long, I was being carried in the arms of a Sasquatch-like being, whose arms and legs were covered in thick, black fur. I do not recall being able to discern any facial features of the creature as every time I tried to make eye contact, it was as if my mind blurred out the terrifying face, I should have been able to see. I also do not remember there being any foul stench, as normally associated with Sasquatch. I would then be carried out of my bedroom, and down the stairs to the landing on the main floor where the kitchen, the living room, and the hallway which leads to the front door, meet. Once there I am frantically looking around as I am screaming in terror for someone, anyone to save me, though I distinctly remember not being able to get away from the beast, no matter how I tried. I was able, however, to gain a fairly good peripheral view of my surroundings. I noted that the entire family was seated in the living room, in the middle of the night, and in various stages of undress, and they seemed to be playing cards. This led me to believe that they were engaged in a game of strip poker. Every member of that staunchly Catholic, and severely sexually repressed family was seated there half naked or more, and fully engaged in a game of cards, from my grandmother, right to my six-year-old sister. All were slowly stripping down, garment by garment. All were oblivious to what was happening to me, as they focused intently on their card game. I screamed and screamed, but no one gave even the slightest indication that they could even hear me, much less respond. Then the beast turned right to exit the front door. This is where it varies on occasion. Sometimes it ends abruptly with the opening of the screen door, and others it ends with me being handed off to something I could not see which carried me up the ladder into some sort of craft, which I also could not see. It felt as though my body was being fully supported at all pressure points by an unseen force. Later on, as these experiences continued, I remember being whisked into a blindingly white room onto a bed. I do not remember the facial features of the beings in that room with me, as I was never able to see any faces clearly. It was like they were always blurred out. I could see every other detail perfectly, but never their faces. I remember them taking something out of my head, through my right nostril. They only did this once that I recall. I remember waking up the next morning with an unexplained nosebleed. Nosebleeds are not something I have ever had, before, nor since. When I was 13 years old, my mother and her husband bought a huge house near Anderson, Indiana. It was built in the 1870s on an area said to be sacred to the Native Americans who had formerly lived there. It had a pool, tennis court, and a small grove of trees, but it had been vacant for several years and was in need of repair. Through research, I discovered that the house had been owned by a very old woman and her husband. Previous to them, it was owned by the woman's family who had been wealthy. The woman had died in the house in the large master bedroom and her husband had died in an unknown accident. There were old servant quarters which was now an apartment and had been occupied by a man by the name of Sam. He informed us that the couple was buried in the grove because they loved it there while they were alive. After we moved in, my mom and I would sit in the sun room. At times, we would smell the strong scent of sickening perfume. We looked all around but couldn't tell where it was coming from. A few weeks later, 
I began to notice more strange activity. My room was on the end of a long hallway in which you had to cross through another room to get to. The rooms were separated by large French doors. My bed was facing towards the door so I could look into the other room. At night, I would hear heavy footsteps walking up and down the stairs and through the hallway. One night, I heard the footsteps coming in my direction from the other room and suddenly stopped. I could hear a faint and steady breathing noise. I just hide under my covers and cried myself to sleep. I told my mother but she simply told me I was imaging it, even though she later admitted that she had heard footsteps. A year or so later, I was on summer vacation. My mother would leave me home alone sometimes so she could go and run errands. Occasionally, I witnessed black shadows out of the corner of my eye when I was watching TV in the living room, but when I would turn to look it would be gone. Once, when I was completely alone in the house, I heard something moving around upstairs. I muted the TV and heard a loud heavy thumping and then footsteps moving quickly back and forth through the hallway and the master bedroom. Later, just before my mother and her husband divorced and we moved out, I had a few friends over. We went into the basement which had an old coal furnace and several other large rooms. My friends and I were pretty curious about the coal furnace, so we opened it up and found a bunch of old newspapers, chicken bones and a vintage amulet. It was obvious that it was made of sterling silver and had a large amethyst mounted on it. I removed it from the furnace, cleaned it up, took it to my room and laid it on my nightstand. Later, I told my mother what I had found and she said that I could keep it. That night, I again heard footsteps coming into my room. But this time, there was distinct crying and sobbing sounds. I was terrified and covered my head with the quilt. After a few minutes, the crying stopped and I pulled back the covers. Then I noticed that the amulet was gone. I looked all over, but never found it. Several years later, I was working on a school project that involved local history. My mother and I still lived in the same area though we now lived in a new smaller house. I was in the library looking through old photographs when I stumbled onto several old post-mortem images. Immediately, I recognized the name of the woman who had lived in the old house previous to us who was buried in the grove. The photo was of her during the wake and around her neck was the exact amulet I had found in the furnace. I never have understood how the amulet got into the furnace, but, I'm willing to bet it's around her neck. The first UFO I saw, my son ran inside and said emphatically, Dad, get out here now. So I jumped out of my chair and went out our south door where he was standing. Two orbs not but 50 feet away were not moving, about two feet off my driveway, so I turned and yelled at my wife that there were UFOs in our drive. We are on a farm not too far from the crash in the early 40s in Cape Girardeau, well, she did come out and I went to grab the camera but, of course, it wasn't there so I grabbed the binoculars. So the three of us were on the porch just staring at them. The sun just set to the west and we were looking south. I was looking through the binoculars so close I could only see parts of the orbs at a time. I was looking for anything man-made. No doors or windows, just both levitating by each other. So my stupid idea was to start walking to them. I got to about 20 to 25 feet from them before they started to rise in unison up over the tall tree line and into the neighbor's gully out of sight. I stayed there for what seemed to be a long time but they never came out. They both looked identical like looking at the sun but a little more orangish but very bright. This was on October 12, 2012 at 7.30 pm people from all walks of life see them from the police, firefighters, our mailman, and so on. Also on our major news channel, they put up a fake UFO. You can find people's pictures and videos if you search UFOs in Cape Girardeau and Jackson, Missouri summer of 2012. I started to get premonitions then my health got so bad I was in the ICU for over 5 months completely paralyzed. And still, to this day I'm recovering. Do you know the last official act of John F. Kennedy as President of the United States? 
The day before he was assassinated in Dallas Kennedy dedicated six new aerospace medical research buildings at Brooks Air Force Base in Texas. There were rumors that JFK may have seen the alien bodies retrieved from the UFO crash near Roswell, New Mexico in 1947. It is said that another former United States president took TV variety star Jackie Gleason, an avid UFO fan, out to Homestead Air Force Base to show him alien bodies on ice. It makes you wonder just how many of our presidents have viewed these alien cadavers. While at Brooks Air Force Base President Kennedy met Major General Theodore C. Bedwell Jr. who had served as Deputy Surgeon and Chief of Industrial Medicine at Wright Field in Ohio, the location where the Roswell cadavers had been taken following their retrieval in 1947. A colleague of Major General Bedwell Jr. claims to have read a classified report that included several color photographs of a highly unusual humanoid body recovered by NASA security personnel at what is known today as the John H. Glenn Research Center at Lewis Field, Ohio. This was where liquid hydrogen rocket engines were developed that enabled NASA's Apollo astronauts to reach the moon. Two nights before the body was taken there had been a wave of UFO activity in the woods surrounding the Glen facility that resembled small, fast-moving balls of blue light darting and zigzagging around the NASA installation. Interestingly, this was similar to the UFO activity described to me by Tom Burnett, co-author of Bigfoot, exploring the myth and discovering the truth. Burnett had observed similar UFO activity near his home in the Cherokee Mountains of North Carolina. Tom claims Bigfoot-like creatures are all over the Smoky Mountains but, unlike his mountain neighbors who moved after experiencing frightening encounters with these mountain monsters he is determined not to let them run him off his property. Once, Tom Burnett had rented his mountain cabin to a couple who, only after a couple of nights, called him from a store in town requesting their deposit back after being frightened by the sound of helicopter blades and the sight of bright lights in the woods in the middle of the night. The creature that had been shot and killed by NASA security near the John H. Glenn Research Center was described as an immense, approximately nine-foot-tall, powerfully muscled monster that matches the description of Bigfoot. The beast was allegedly autopsied and found to have 32 teeth like most humans, vocal cords resembling those of humans and, even stranger was the small, metallic device found embedded within its lower left arm that resembled a highly advanced tracking device or transmitter. Eventually, the remains of the creature, including the transmitter, were taken to the Foreign Technology Division of Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. Nothing else is known regarding the incident. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.